Welcome to the Second Bite Podcast, where we talk with top entrepreneurs and CEOs about creating valuable companies through creative transactions. Now, let's get started with the show. Welcome to another episode of the Second Bite Podcast. Todd Tasky is your host. Paul Olinger is your, your guest today. Paul, so happy to be with us. Thank you, Todd. I wore my my fleece vest because I understand you have some venture capitalists and private equity guys. You are exactly well dressed for this, right? I'm, yeah. I'm 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 a junior hedge fund analyst in my in my Helly Hansen uh, fleece vest. Excellent. Well, so here's the interesting thing. Um, we've uh, this is the first time I've had a professional comedian uh, on the podcast. Don't be don't be intim- intimidated. I'm, I'm human just like you, Todd. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do my, I'm going to do my best, but yes. here's the other thing that's interesting. The, the topic that you cover often mm. is the way that people process money and wealth and what that means. And m- many of the folks on our podcast, I think would be considered many of the people that listen would be considered quote unquote winners at life, at least from an economic standpoint. Sure. Some people that brings them big fulfillment, other people it leaves them with questions still and holes. And I thought this would make me all the things that uh, for some reason it hasn't yet. So I want to explore that, but I also think it's fascinating from the background that you came from because you were early first 200 or so employees at Facebook now known as Meta. (laughs) Um, that must've been a tremendous trip and influenced a lot of the way you think about today. So maybe you could take us from the beginning and, and recount some of those early days and early lessons and experiences from, from Facebook. Sure. Um, hello, winners at life and losers in the bedroom. Um, yeah, I, 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 well, I'll go all the way back. I'll tell you my story and, uh, big Catholic family grew up one of six kids parents stayed together for 55 years. We had everything we needed, but uh, we were not, we were not a a luxury laden family. Let's put it that way. And, um, my parents were great parents, but my, my folks were very, uh, frugal depression era people. And I remember thinking as a kid, gosh, if we just, uh, when I grow up, I want to make a lot of money because I don't want to worry about money. And, um, and so I set myself on this path to be a winner at life get good grades, go to a good college, get a good job, make money, be happy. That was sort of the equation. So I eventually end up at business school at Dartmouth in uh, the mid nineties. And uh, I went there because I wanted to make more money. I was in, I was in educational fundraising before that because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I've always been a bit of a smart ass, um, sarcastic joker type person. And I've always been a huge fan of stand up comedy, but it never struck me as something that was real to do. I I was in plays in high school and I remember thinking, this is the most fun I've ever had. Uh, yeah, I'm a drama kid underneath, uh, underneath. I was not going to bring it up, but I'm sure uh, underneath this rugged exterior, I was very cool as a drama kid. Yeah, I was, I played on the football team and was also a drama geek because I loved attention. Anyway, there's a point to this. I promise. Uh, I remember being on stage and thinking, well, I love doing this, but this isn't a real job. This isn't something, you know, that's practical. So I'm going to go to college. I'm going to major in business. And then just to diversify my thinking, I'm going to go get an MBA, which I did. And so I was at business school. I wrote a couple of smart alecky uh, articles for the student paper, which back then was sort of a uh, satirical uh, paper, the Tuck Times. And somebody asked me to co-host the school talent show. A second year asked me to co-host the talent show with him. And so I said, I did. And I, you know, we had a lot of fun. And, and for 15 minutes, I roasted my friends and just got these waves of laughter that were narcotic in their impact. Um, in the sense of, they, they didn't put me to sleep. They, they just lit me up in a way I'd never been lit up before. And I was like, oh, this is it. what I want to do. And I had borrowed $80,000 in 1995 dollars, which would be 150 or something like that today. And back then we had this silly notion, Todd, follow me if you will. Um, If you borrow money, you pay it back. Yes, an antiquated system. An antiquated notion is, it's just a silly, silly notion that we had. Um, And so I was like, well, I'm not gonna go be a stand-up comedian with 80 grand hanging over my head. And so what would I like to do? I figured out I wanted to be in TV or movies because I thought someday I'll be discovered in a marketing meeting. 
And that was a silly plan. But nobody in the in the traditional media world, which then was, you know, print, uh, TV and film was really interested in talking to me because I had no experience. And so I was like, well, hell, this digital media thing is new. Nobody has any experience in that. So I'll just try to get a job in that field. And I'll go into sales because that's basically what I've all, always done. And so I got a job uh, running the, the East Coast sales team for a, a monthly CD-ROM, an ad-supported CD-ROM, music CD-ROM called Launch. It, was a, uh, it, it had music videos on it. It had interviews with movie stars and rock bands and stuff. And a few months later, after I started, we, we launched our website, launch.com. And so it became kind of a music destination, like, like rollingstone.com with a radio player in days before bandwidth was a thing. So, right, I mean, we had a, the right idea at the wrong time. We had these great music players that were a lot like Spotify, but it was way before people could listen on their phone. You had to, you had to plug into the, the ethernet at your home or in your office to get into you know, streaming. And I worked there for four years. We sold to Yahoo uh, for change that Jerry Yang found in his couch. They paid $6 billion to Mark Cuban for his hunk of crap company and then threw everything away and then paid like $12 million for ours. And, and it became Yahoo Music and, and, and stayed Yahoo Music for a long time. And were you worked, an owner in that business, Paul? I, well, I mean, I had some equity. I had very, very little equity, but... Um, uh, I, I got some equity at Yahoo. And then and in 2001, you know, the, the stock started coming back or 2002, 2003. And so I paid off my loans. And I'd always said if I ever was, was had some money in the bank and was still single, I would go do comedy. And I did. And I went out to LA and I hosted for two years at the Improvs in Orange County. So you quit. So I walked away from Yahoo. I would put some money in the bank. I paid off my student loans. And I went out to LA to do. And you're how old at the time? I was 35. Wow! So not a spring chicken. Not not a not a kid at that point. Tell you what, though, um, it takes some courage if if you don't have anything to leave behind and go try to make your way in LA. And I get that when you're in your 20s. When you do it and you're 35 years old, man, it takes a lot of balls, especially when you're making money at Yahoo. And yeah, I'm making, I'm making, I mean, I'm making a 400 grand in salary and, and, and maybe double that with equity. And I walked away. And everyone and, thought you were nuts. No, the Yahoo people have, I just did a show in San Francisco last week and probably a third of the, a quarter of the crowd at least was Yahoo people. So I, I performed comedy at our 2003 sales conference in front of, I don't know, six or 700 people. And the day after that, I was a celebrity inside the company. Like I was that guy. Yeah. And then people, because I made fun of the executives and the executives loved it. And I got to contribute to the culture of the company, which was a really fun place to work back then. Mm -hmm. It was, I really enjoyed being a part of Yahoo. And I, I worked with amazingly talented people. When I read in the you know, in the, in the press about, well, I've got these toxic colleagues. Yeah, sure. There were a few people that weren't great, but on average, the people were just outstanding at launch.com and at Yahoo. And, um, so, so I, had, I got, I became a little bit of kind of a personality inside the company. And when I told them I was leaving to go do comedy, they were not surprised and everybody was extraordinarily supportive. And, and, you know, it's, it's, I'm just so grateful for those relationships of people I worked with 22 years ago showing up to see me do comedy, you know, as a 55 year old, it's pretty awesome. That's so, a great compliment, right? Well, I think it's just a testimony to the quality of people and the strength of the relationships we built because we were all very passionate about like seeing where this new medium was going to go. People that were working in the internet back then were very curious. They were like, sure, there were a lot of people that it was a, you know, it was a gold rush on some level. But in 2001, it didn't feel like a gold rush. Yeah. You know, you know it felt like it, we were all just trying to figure it out. And anyway, it was a really great place to work. And so I go out to LA and I'm doing, I'm, I'm doing comedy every weekend for two years. I'm opening for, I went out there as I had barely done comedy and I was terrible, but I was opening for some stars like Norm MacDonald and Roseanne Barr and Dave Attell and just, I mean, amazing, amazing people. Did those guys pump you up? Like, were they like, hey, keep at it. You're doing okay. Or were they? <laughs> everybody, almost everybody was very nice to me. Okay. And supportive because I was like kind of 
uh, I had gotten very, very lucky getting that position and everybody was very, very, um, uh, very supportive, if not diplomatic, some people more so than others, but the people I just mentioned were all really, really nice and encouraging. And there's no feeling like as a young comedian, like hanging out in the green room with Norm Macdonald for three nights in a row for a few different weekends a year. It's like, the yeah, gr- that's, that's, cool. that's the greatest, that's the greatest compensation you can get as a young comic. So you're, you're kind of on your way. I mean, that's a substantial job, right? You're, you're in the spotlight, even if it's not always directly on you. How does Facebook come about? Well, because, you know, I don't know what I thought was going to happen when I moved to LA. You know, I thought, I guess I thought on some level that I was, I was going to move out there and they were going to be like, where have you been? We've been waiting for you. (laughs) My gosh, how, how can we make you a star? How, and you know, you don't, I mean, I remember sitting in the, in the green room one night with Ralphie May, the late great Ralphie May. And he said to me, he's like, man, don't worry about it. You'll, you'll start to figure it out in about eight years. And I was like, eight years. I was like, dude, I, my opportunity cost of doing this is a lot of money, more than a most. lot yeah. of money. And so, and that in, in comedy or any artistic pursuit, you can't have a plan B. It has to be plan A. And you have, if you want to make it, you have to be completely dedicated to the craft and to the, to the work that's required to earn the right to do the craft. And so, and that means hustling like crazy. I didn't know how great a job I had when I was hosting at those improvs in Orange County because people would have killed for that job. Sure. And so I was like eight years. I don't know, man. I don't know if I have 10 years in me to really figure this out. And that's what it takes. You know, when I hit about eight years in comedy, I felt, and I was like, I feel like I kind of am getting the hang of it. And I remember what Ralphie said. And I was like, oh, this is what he means. This you know, it's means. interesting because I, I think a lot of what you're sharing probably resonates with this audience because you go into business by myself or with a couple guys. And now we're, you know, you're a couple years in, things are starting to click. You're like, man, I figured it out. And then two years after, you're like, man, I don't know what I'm doing. Sure. And then two years later, you're like, you know what? I think I know what I'm doing again. So it's very similar to that. I, I, well, you know, the 10,000 hour rule applies to a lot of different crafts, whether that's entrepreneurship or playing the guitar or being a pastry chef, man. I mean, like, it really takes that. Like, you know, Bill Burr said, I'll paraphrase, he's like, you get into comedy because you're the funny guy at the bar because you always make your friends laugh. And then it takes you 10 years to figure out how to be that guy on stage. And I think that's right. I think it's right. Um, I'm just figuring it out, like how to walk on stage and be yourself. And that was the goal, right? Like, so um, let's come back to be yourself and how to, how to show up authentically in the world, because that's what led me here. But what led me to want to do comedy was this desire to, was this thing that I think I could be good at this. And I had the opportunity to do it in, in LA for a couple of years. And I was very, very fortunate. But like I said, I didn't, I don't, I didn't think I wanted to have a family and I got engaged to my wife and mother of my two children today, who's inside in the house. Um, and I was like, I think I should probably get a job. So, and, well, and let me ask this, cause let's assume you're good at comedy, right? You're making a living, you're enjoying it. You got a career going there, but you're also good at the marketing and the internet and, and Yahoo. And, yeah. And, yeah. But, I was but, really, I was, I was very good at that. I mean, you're you know, also making 400 plus a year doing that. That should, that's right. that that's should right. make you a little more confident over there, but you chose the harder road. It's well, no, I mean, I, I, you know, I don't know. I chose the road. I've, I've gone back and forth between comedy and, and the corporate world, or I went back and forth. I have, I'm no longer going back and forth between the corporate world and comedy, not for the last 12, not for the last, um, nine years, full-time comedy, full-time comedy for the last nine years, writing, podcasting, and comedy. So I, so I, as I'm thinking I should get a job, this is 2007, you know, cause I just got engaged and I don't want to be the guy sleeping on the couch when his wife goes off to work and, you know, I'm going to go do some spots tonight. And it just wasn't, I, and I guess I didn't have the confidence in myself to think that I could get to a point where I was going to be making real money, you know, doing comedy. Um, and so I, I, I left comedy or well, 
what happened was a buddy of mine that I worked with at, at Yahoo called me and said, Hey, I need a salesperson in LA for, for this new social media company where I work. And it had about 25, uh, 20 million monthly unique users, but it was growing at this incredible clip and it was all over the news. And that company was Facebook. And this is 2007? 2007. I started in May 2007 as a salesperson in Los Angeles. And we were selling ads, very, very rudimentary ads um, with the worst technology and no tracking and all this stuff. But people, you know, it was really easy to get meetings with senior level people because Facebook, even at that point, I mean, it was only two years old. But, and it, it was, was on, on the a, edge, right? It, well, it was, it was growing at, at meteoric rates. And so, and, 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 and even a relatively unsophisticated person could say, if I join and two of my friends join and two of their friends join, well, that's geometric growth. And when something's growing at that rate, it's going to get big in a hurry. And so I joined as about the 250th employee and a salesperson in LA. That's how I got to Facebook. Wow. And the early days, the, and you were there, what, four or five years? Four and a half years. I should have stuck around. There's, they made me, so they, you know, it's funny when it, it, they, they were dangling some pretty hefty carrots. And had I known how big the, the company was going to get, I probably would have stuck around, but, but life has worked out just fine for me. Um, and, 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 and on the road I've chosen. Yeah. And you had risen the ranks there, like as happens with a rapidly growing company. So you, again, for the second time, you must've left behind something significant to pursue comedy. Well, so yeah, I got promoted a couple of times, um, to, I, and I ended up running the West coast sales team. And, um, so we were selling ads from, you know, San Diego up to Seattle, uh, everybody from Nike to Sony electronics. And I was doing it for two years and it was a hard place to work. I gotta be honest. I mean, it was growing. It's a grind, so fast. Right? Yeah. It was a grind. It was growing super fast. You had a lot of channel conflict. You had a lot of rudimentary product that wasn't ready for the market. There was a culture of, you know, if you saw the social network and, and the whole thing about ads, not being cool. I think a lot of people at Facebook still thinks ads still think ads aren't cool, right? Like, even though that's 100% of their revenue or 99%, whatever it is, um, you know, ads aren't cool. It gets in the way of a great product. And, and, and certainly the religion, the, the, they embraced it a lot more after the IPO and the stock didn't go to the moon. They got really serious about ads. And, um, but I'd already left the company. But so I, so I spent four and a half years there. Uh, I was fully vested and I was like, you know what? What, I, what, was, what was happening really was that, that, that those same urges that made me want to be a comedian were, were calling at me again. Like, I wanted to figure out a way to show up authentically in the world, to be myself, to be able to say what I wanted to say. And corporate life isn't necessarily the best environment in which to do that. And now and, here's the thing, though. Excuse me to interrupt. There's a lot of people feel like that. A lot. Totally but they stick with the money. They raise a family. They, you know, buy a vacation home somewhere and yeah. that's a great life, right? Why couldn't you just do that? Well, because I, you know, I, I've asked myself that a thousand times. Why can't I just be happy being in the 99th percentile, you know, doing, you know, working for a great company and, you know, being a part of a team. And Were you I think, unhappy? Was I unhappy? Yeah. I was pretty unhappy because I, I just, I, I felt like I, there was something in me that needed to get out and I wasn't going to be able to do that at Facebook. Or maybe I was, I just didn't see a way to do it. And, um, you know, I, I, as I was, I've told people this, that what I was looking for was a way to be myself in a, in a, in a professional manner. How do I go? And I mean, and yes, you can be your version of a, of a corporate person or a lawyer or a fireman or a teacher, you can use those opportunities for self-expression. Um, but a funny thing happens when you make enough money to live on for the rest of your life. If you're not a jerk, like all of a sudden you have this opportunity to do anything you want. And it's both wonderful and incredibly intimidating. You've heard about the paradox of choice where more choices paralyze us. And, you know, Barry Schwartz, whom I've interviewed on my podcast, uh, the author of The Paradox of Choice, you know, he talks about it. He's like, if you have 
three pairs of jeans to choose from. You're going to pick one and you're going to be like, you're not going to think about it again. If you have 37 pairs of jeans to choose from, you're going to spend two hours in the gap wherever you buy your jeans. And then as you, as you walk out of the gap, you're going to be like, did I make the right decision? And think about if we do that, <clears throat> excuse me, if we do that choosing dungarees or cereal, think about how much more we will do that when it's what you're going to do with your life. Yeah. You know? So, so lo- let me ask this. A yeah. lot of guys or women have during that pro during those four years have bought a bigger house with a big mortgage and the kids yeah. are in private schools and that's right. two cars with leases. That's it, right. It is, so it, it makes that choice seem a lot less uh, real. Did you make conscious decisions to never do that? Or were you always frugal from that standpoint? Did you know you were going to go back to comedy one day? Well, you know, I, um, we, we've, everybody's got a different spending ceiling, right? And so I've always been pretty conservative when it comes to money and the things that we would like to do that we don't do because we prioritize, um, professional self-determination over, uh, over stuff or experiences is like, Hey, I don't have a NetJets card. You know, we sure would like one, but, but that's not what I have. And what's funny is, you know, I grew up thinking, I, I got to the point where I could live in the neighborhood that I thought was the greatest neighborhood in the city of Atlanta when I was growing up. I could belong to the country club that I thought was the coolest country club in town. I could send my kids to private school. I could drive the cars I wanted. I could do great vacations. That's what I thought wealth was. And then you put yourself in that situation and all the guys at the club, you realize, oh, they don't have 5 million or 10 million. They have 100 million. Or they have a billion and they're, they have their own jets and you go, oh, I did. I wasn't totally conscious of that, even in Silicon Valley. Yeah. And because, you say, oh, no wonder I'm not happy. I don't have that. Well, that's a, well, that's, that's a game that I really, that, that's a game we play with ourselves or our brains. It's a trick our brains play on us. And it really is dangerous. It's a, it's a very natural evolved human condition. If you, if, if you don't want to be your brain's bitch, you better learn how to manage that instinct. And, um, you know, so it's like we've made conscious decisions to do the work we want to do as opposed to trying to keep up with the, the rich, the billionaire Joneses in a race that is unwinnable. And, and so um, <clears throat> you've got to get to a And this is why I started the podcast, because I quit my job at 42. And I didn't go back to comedy. I didn't just go, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a tiny little cold here today. I didn't go, I, I was scared about going back to comedy because I'd kind of failed once or I'd, I'd quit once and I didn't want to look like a fickle person. I was worried about what my technology colleagues would think. I was, didn't know where to start in Atlanta because I, I didn't have any contacts here. So I was scared. And in fact, when I did start going to open mics again here in Atlanta, I've pushed myself out the door to go to open mics. And then I went to a few and I did okay. And then I went to one and I bombed so bad that on the way home, I was like, I, this is foolish. I need to get a job. And so I took a job working for a small software company. You you didn't need a job. I didn't need, I didn't need a job, but 24 hours a day to fill. Yeah. But I felt like, well, I don't know what to do with myself. So what's the easiest thing to do is to go get a job in the industry where I have some credibility, where I can tell people, there was this one experience I had when, when a little bit before this, when I had been out of work for, I don't know, 18 months. And we went to dinner with new, with, with the parents of, of friends of our kids who were like three or four at the time. And so we went to dinner with these two, two uh, gorgeous doctors who were the parents of my daughter's classmates. And uh, I'm sitting there talking to the dad at the end of the table and, and, um, I was like, so what kind of medicine do you practice? And he's like, well, I'm a pediatric oncologist and neurosurgeon, and um, I'm doing research using nanofibers to help slow the spread of cancer in the brains of infants. Then he looks at me, he's like, what do you do? (laughs) Nothing. (laughs) And I was like, I'm a blogger, you know? I was like, I'm writing funny articles on the internet. Not, you know, not every week, because that would take a lot of effort and dedication. How could I do that? And I realized in that moment, I was like, I'm kind of a piece of shit right now. Like, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I didn't feel, I felt like a rich loser. And I was like, wait a minute, this isn't, this isn't okay. I need to find a path. Like, 
And so I started reading. <clears throat> I started reading everything I could about money. I started reading everything I could about the professional art. Like and investing money? No, about like, the psych- money? about like the psychology of money. But Morgan Housel hadn't written that book yet. So it was really about why does money, what's the connection between money and happiness? And I learned about like <clears throat> the hedonic treadmill, you know, and the hedonic treadmill is this psychological concept where in our brains, we have a basic set point of happiness. And whether we get in an accident and lose a leg or we win the lottery, eventually we come right back to our base point of happiness. We get used to everything. We habituate to everything. Like uh, we were talking about earlier, like a luxury becomes a need. That's absolutely the case. It's also, we, we can also adapt to losing luxuries um, or losing, you know, necessities like our legs. Like we, we're an adaptive species. And on, and, and on one hand, that keeps us alive when tragedy happens. But on the other hand, it keeps us from feeling exhilaration when, when we, you know, are, are blessed with a bounty of, you know, tons and tons of money. And what happens is you go, oh, okay, well, this isn't, this money alone isn't going to make me feel the way I want to feel. And I want people to know that. I don't want to, and some people think like, oh, you're just whining about, you know, having the, 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 the responsibilities that come with money. There are responsibilities that come with money, but I'm not whining about it. I want to talk about it because it's, it's, I want to normalize the discussion of what money can and can't do for you. And you talk about it on your podcast. A hundred. Yes. I've done the crazy money podcast for five years, 200 it's episodes. Great, by the way, I've listened to a few episodes. So for those listening, the crazy money podcast is a must fall. Yeah. And it, thanks man. And so, you know, I've really, I've, and, and this reading, you know, one thing makes you want you reading. One thing makes you want to read another. And another thing that I learned was that, and, it, and this might be common sense for a lot of your listeners, but there's actual science about it. And you can read it in philosophy. And the same thing philosophers were struggling with 2,000 years ago are the same things we're struggling with today. Comparing ourselves to others. Having a noisy brain that tells us that we're not enough. All these things um, that, <clears throat> you know, that we don't judge. The, the one big thing to take away is that we don't judge. We, we generally determine our happiness not based on our own internal feelings but on our relative position to other people in the tribe. Right. And so we sit there and go, oh, um, I wish I had, my neighbor just got a new car and I want a new car and it makes me feel bad that he got one and I didn't. And there's studies that have been done very recently. <clears throat> Excuse me again. Liz Dunn from, I believe the University of British Columbia and a guy named Mike Norton from Harvard Business School wrote a book called Happy Money. And they reported that in, in some studies, you know, you, you've heard all this. There's no additional happiness past $75,000 a year in income. That's Angus Deaton and Daniel Kahneman. And I got to interview Nobel Prize winning Angus Deaton, Princeton economist in his office. That's a great one. It's early, uh, Todd. You should go back and dig that one up. Um, we'll put that, uh, by the way, for listeners, we'll put that in the show notes, both the book and that, that episode. So, so what they found was that, you know, there is declining marginal happiness after you've got your basic needs met, right? When the, when, when economic chaos has left your life, additional money does less for you than it did when it was relieving real pain. Mm-hmm. And I know that because when I drove a junker car when I was 25 with no air conditioning, and I was always afraid that it wouldn't start and that, you know, I'd have to go put $800 on my Visa card to pay the mechanic. Like that was real pain. That was real psychic pain. But upgrading from an Audi to a Mercedes, that's not, <clears throat> that doesn't relieve real pain, you know? So, <clears throat> Pardon me. So, so, um, so what Mike Norton and Liz Dunn reported was that, okay, that might be true, but, you know, we also don't know a lot about millionaires and happiness because millionaires don't fill out surveys. And so they got some research done with, with a partner bank and they surveyed, I believe, thousands of millionaires. And they asked, how happy are you on a scale of one to 10? And they would personally would answer and then say, now, what would it take to get you to a 10? And all of them, including multimillionaires, basically said two to three times what I have. Yeah. That's what we all think. And it's all false. It's patently false. The answer would still be the same. If I had 25 million instead of 10 million, I wouldn't need then 75 to be happier. But, you know, right. 
because it's a the, the horizon by definition is just out of your reach and your horizon never stops. Yeah. And so you so we play all these games with ourselves and say, well, if I just had, if I just had a NetJets card, then I'd be happy. And then you get a NetJets card and you start hanging out at the FBO and, and you go, gosh, I, you know, I, I don't like to rent. I think I should own a plane. And I mean, like it just, it just doesn't stop. Right, it just right, never, right. ever stops. And you, I, de- you deal with all that in a very, humorous way in your comedy. I mean, it's not all that your comedy is, but you talk a lot about this in your comedy, correct? I do some in the right circumstances. And I'm trying to figure out how to talk about having money without coming across like an asshole. Yeah. And tricky. it's a tricky, so I, it's a tricky line to, to cross and I haven't figured it out, but I'm trying to be honest. I'm trying to show up honestly on stage and, you know, um, I, I do some jokes about it. I can talk more frankly about it in the shows I do at country clubs. And I do, I've done, I think, 25 shows at country clubs in the last two and a half years around Atlanta and the Southeast. And, you know, one of the jokes I talk about is, is skiing. That, you know, I grew up middle class. I didn't start skiing until I was in business school in New England. Uh, and, and I was skiing on ice and it was freezing and half the people there were wearing jeans. But I was doing the thing and I was really grateful for it because I wanted to learn how to ski and I didn't know how else I was going to do that. And, you know, then I went into the, into the corporate world and I made some money and then I got to, I went to Deer Valley one time and I was like, Oh my gosh, this, okay. Now this is what skiing is supposed to be. This is the best, like blue skies, big mountains, fluffy powder, 30 degrees, you know, none of this new England gator, you know, with frozen snot hanging off your nose nonsense. And so you're out in Utah and there's like a St. Regis there and you're like, oh, this is, I've made it. This is the best. (laughs) And then my buddy invites me for a long weekend at a place called the Yellowstone Club, which is like Brigadoon. Private skiing at its best. Private skiing at its best. Private powder. And you're like, oh, no lift lines. Not short lift lines. No lift lines. Free food on on the slopes. Free drinks on the slopes. You know, who are the members? Bill Gates, Justin Timberlake, you know, Tom Brady. Tom Brady. You know, I look at my buddy on the lift and I'm like, you know what? Deer Valley is a shithole. <laughs> right. And so it's all of a sudden you're like, you're, our expectations, our, our, our appetites never stop growing. And once you find, like, I didn't miss Yellowstone Club when I didn't know it existed. Right. You know, I wasn't sitting there going, I wish there was a place to ski that's better than Deer Valley. You know? Yeah. And so, and so if you don't know about this stuff, you're not missing it in your life. But when you find out about it, we, we start to feel inadequate because we don't have it. Yeah. And those are, those are some of the real challenges. I think that, you know, again, many of our, my listeners face, uh, once they do a transaction, all of them, even before they do a transaction are very successful because they're making, you know, they're making good money and they built a valuable business, but it's, it's, they just, you know, it is ingrained in the personality type of an entrepreneur to, ju- to do more and more and more. That's right. And it's the, other, uh, it's the other edge of that sword, I think, that, that makes so many of us successful at those endeavors and perhaps wears us out, you know, a little bit from, from that perspective. But I, I would say this, the, the podcast that you do, the Crazy Money Podcast, is a great source and it's it's not you know constantly picking at this scab, but it, it is a wider berth that I find pretty entertaining. And there's great guests on that. Let me ask this as we wrap up. I see a bunch of books over your shoulder. Yes. Pick one of those that you would make as a recommendation for somebody to read. If you, because I'll tell you what I would pick, which I just finished. Morgan Housel, you mentioned him earlier. Yep. Psychology of Money. Yep. I don't know if you've read his new book, Same as Ever. I have not read it yet. I, I loved Psychology of Money. Love yep, it. Yep. This is twice as good. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's high praise. Twice as good. High I praise. Read it, I took notes on it. I reached out to Morgan. I'm hoping I can get him to, to come and spend some time on this podcast. But that, I, I would say that that's my recommendation of the year. What's yeah. your? Well, I'm glad you asked me to recommend two books. So, um, the, I'll give you two. Ryan Holiday's Stillness is the Key is a really great one. And that's, I had him on the podcast a few years ago, right when it was coming out. And that's really where it dawned on me that um, he's got it in his, in his cupboard, in his credenza, 
Yeah, I uh, might have taken it home. I like your I like your credenza. Every man should have a credenza in his an office. An old one from the seventies. They're right. tough to get. They're I was going to get. I was going to say, where's your fax machine, Todd? Um, um, ego, ego is the enemy. Is my favorite run. All, well, all those things. There, I think the most. I if uh, the religion that all of us of all different faiths should be practicing is stoicism, in my opinion. And by the way, you can be any religion and be a stoic. Amen. And so, um, because what they're doing is, is looking at how our brains work and how we work as people and helping us become aware of the way our brain leads us into trouble. And that being still, being quiet, being okay with yourself, is the first step in leading a good life. And so I really loved, and, and also it, when you read this and you're reading words written 2000 years ago that, that tell you all the trouble we're causing in our modern world, in our own heads, it's like, oh, I'm part of a, of a long line of, of, you know, yeah. overthinkers. Right. This is what it means to be human. And so there's a lot of consolation. So that's in, number in one. That. That's number one. Number two is just um, <laughs> is uh, uh, Bill Browder's Red Notice. And oh my goodness! One of the greatest of all time. It is one of the most fascinating reads that you will ever pick up. And that book's got to be ten or twelve years old. I think it's like five, but I ha- I also had him on the podcast. He was very gracious to come on the podcast and talk about it. You know, and 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 it, it's the story of a guy who went to the Eastern Bloc in the, I think it was like 1988. So yeah. when, when, when Poland and Russia are just opening up after the Cold War, he's there on the ground as, a, I think like a McKinsey consultant or maybe Bain. And, and then he starts a hedge fund in Moscow in like 1994. And he bought that information from the dude in the square or just on a floppy? Oh my gosh. It's like, it, and then he, and he makes all this money and it talks about the, uh, the denationalization of Russia, and then he runs afoul of Vladimir Putin, and it's just a. I'm surprised he's still walking. To tell you the truth, I, I mean, for sure, for he's sure, got a good record of tracking folks. Yeah, there. I mean, you know, his, but yeah, Navalny uh, is no longer with us for that very reason. So, anyway, I, if if you're interested in world events and you like a gripping read, Bill Browder's Road Notice is the and, best. And book you there. had Bill Browder on the on the Crazy Money podcast. I did. Yeah. Oh yeah. shit! All right, geez, man, I gotta I gotta get more episodes. Um and. Paul is uh, on your website, which is paulolinger.com. Correct. Has all of your uh, appearance dates. Coming to Washington, D.C., April 19th and 20th. So yes. I will uh, probably, I like to heckle from the left of stage. Okay. If you hear that, that's where I'll be. Nice. Um, I'll probably bring a gang of folks, too. So Terrific. We'll, uh, so that'll be great to see you live. will be fantastic. It was super generous of you to spend time and share some of your experience and thinking and and the rest. And I will wish you the best in your career, in your comedy and with the podcast as well. Right back at you, Todd. Thank you for having me. Paul, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Second Bite Podcast. We'll see you again next time. And be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.